This week, the Public Utilities and Regulatory Commission has demanded that the Electricity Company of Ghana provides it with a comprehensive report on its transformer crisis. Along with that report, the power retailer must present a load shedding timetable for use by customers. That is in line with minority calls for a schedule to help consumers plan accordingly. Today on Hot Issues, we ask are faulty transformers the only reason for the erratic power supply? On the program today, we speak to the man who has gone frontal with the Electricity Company of Ghana and called them out for their deceit and incompetencies. What did he do differently when he was in power? We'll find out. I am Kemeni Amano, and my guest today is Minorities Ranking Member on Parliament's Mines and Energy Committee. He's also MP for Yape Kusogo. John Abdullah Jinapo is my guest on Hot Issues. You're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you. From the minority perspective, with the current state of power in this country, what do you think is happening? Well, thank you very much. First of all, we shouldn't be in this situation. Unlike what pertained around 2014, getting to the end of 2015, the Akusomo Hydro Dam had gone down so much that you simply couldn't do anything. And when the Hydro Dam is down, no matter the amount of money you have, you simply cannot generate enough energy. Today, as we speak, the dam is so full that they are spilling and it's even causing havoc. So with a rated capacity of about 1,020, during our time we could generate just about 300 megawatts. So mm -hmm. it meant that there was a deficit of about 700 megawatts. Today, the dam is full. We have enough thermal complementation. We have some readily available gas based on the gas processing plant that we established. We also have what you call the cash water for mechanism that's giving close to 30 billion for this government. The challenge as we speak today is an issue of fuel. That is it. If this government is able to mobilize some money and to procure fuel, they'll be able to generate enough power because the peak demand is about 3,600, but they're able to generate between 3,000 to 3,200. Not because the plants are idle or unavailable. Mm -hmm. The plants are available, but there's no fuel to fire the plants. And the key ones are the Kungtema plant and then the Senate plant. If they get fuel for them, we wouldn't experience the load shedding that we're experiencing. And we've been experiencing this load shedding or what is known now local parlance as doom, so since January. So it's been consistent for like three months. Well, the, the, con the concern about fuel or identifying fuel as a problem, I, I think this is the first one I'm hearing because what the ECG has been telling us a lot is the fact that you don't have money. It's not because they, they have fuel problems. Yeah, so you need the money to buy the fuel. So if you need to buy heavy fuel oil, which we call HFO, you need money. If you need to buy distillate oil, you need money. If you need to buy LCO, which is light crude oil, you need money. Without that money, you'll be unable to buy that fuel. Okay, so I was hoping that you'd explain uh, the relation between the ECG saying they don't have money because they are only a retailer. And so how does it go up, very you know, good, the, the, the cycle? So let me give you a simple system. You have the generation plants here. You need to generate that power. Mm -hmm. And then you have the transmission system, which is grid code. They need to wheel that power and then deliver it to ECG. ECG is the distributor. So you lower it to 11 kVA. And then ECG then sells the power to you. When we were leaving office, we had brought down the losses to about 20%. With the introduction of the private sector, the losses were supposed to come down to 8%. Today, as we speak, the losses have ballooned to about 34%. So when ECG sells power, say, hypothetically, if they sell 100 CD, they are unable to collect up to 70 CD. So mm. there's a deficit of more than 34 cities. Beyond that is what you call the exchange rate losses. Because of this government's incompetence and the way the currency has depreciated, even this year alone, even as they claim they are doing well, the currency is depreciating close to 10% in under three months. So the exchange rate losses alone is about $200 million to $300 million per annum. Mm -hmm. So even if they were to collect 100%, they cannot pay. And so they are unable to get the money like they are admitting. 
to pay the generation companies. And the generation companies will require that amount of money to buy the fuel. So if you have a car and you don't have petrol in the car, right. it's valueless. Right. And so, 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 so the true cost is actually fuel. And it's, it. and it's caused by the fact that we don't have the money. It's not that That's the fuel it. is not even available. The fuel is available. If you have the money, you can readily buy the fuel. But because of the state of bankruptcy of this economy, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Finance is unable to support ECG to buy fuel. Worst of all, even the power that we consume, i.e. the police service, the military, the hospitals, the schools, the Ministry of Finance under the Extended Credit Facility Agreement, under the IMF program, has confirmed and agreed that they will pay. Since August 2023, they have not paid even one city. That one alone has ballooned to about 1.4 billion. Wait, made payment from where to where? I, so I think I missed that. Every month, mm -hmm. when we consume electricity, we pay ordinary consumers, myself and you. Mm -hmm. But the hospitals, the police service, the military, when they consume, ECG will submit the bills to the Ministry of Finance, and Ministry of Finance will make payment. I'm saying since August, no the Ministry of Finance made. has not paid even one city. I see. And that is outstanding. So the ECG cannot get the money to pay the generation companies, let alone buy fuel. No payment has been done since August. How about the period when ECG has been threatening to disconnect them? To the best of your knowledge, still no payment has no been made. No payment. Whatever ECG has been able to collect are those MDAs that are not under the Ministry of Finance's payment. Some of the MDAs that we do not consider as critical. They have to pay on, through their own budget. So when ECG disconnects parliament, parliament has to go and pay. Mm -hmm. But ECG cannot disconnect the hospitals because people are on oxygen. ECG cannot disconnect the police station. ECG cannot even enter the military balance, let alone disconnect them. So they keep consuming. The Ministry of Finance and government is unable to pay. The debt is building up. And as we speak today, the current liability in the energy sector value chain mm -hmm. is about $1.5 billion. $1. When you convert that to CDs, that's about 17 billion CDs. And it's piling and piling. And so my fear, and it's a legitimate fear, and I've briefed the flag bearer, His Excellency President Muhammad, that on an assumption of office, mm -hmm. he's going to inherit a weakened, anemic, emaciated, run-down energy sector. And this government is just undertaking what you call palliative measures, mm -hmm. just trying to manage the system and dump it once again on President Mahama. And he has to undertake what you call the heavy lifting once again. Because when we assumed office, I recall when we had our first briefing with President Mahama at the Flagstaff House. Just after the briefing, he said, look, I'm going to take responsibility. I'm not going to blame anybody. He came to Parliament and told us the state of the energy sector we had a deficit, we had a generation problem, we had a financial problem, we had a fuel problem, he was going to solve it comprehensively. By the time we left office, we had a tourable gas processing plant. Mm -hmm. But for that tourable gas processing plant, we incur additional cost of $300 million to $400 million every year. And you can imagine over eight years, if you had to cough up $400 million in terms of import substitution with light crude oil, that's a huge burden. So the fuel issue was addressed with that turbo gas processing mm -hmm. plant. The generation issue was addressed with the rapid mobilization of thermal complementary power that has never been witnessed before. Ameri, AXA, Early Power, mentioned them. All right. of them were so, brought so, on board. So since you have been talking about the previous administration, what was the debt level in the energy sector that you left behind before, you know? Before we left, office? the total debt at that time, when they checked, was about 1.7 billion cities. 1.7 billion cities? Cities. Today, it's 17 billion cities. That is why we came up with what you call the energy sector levies, mm -hmm. which was supposed to generate about 4 billion per annum. How is ESLA doing now? ESLA has been mortgaged. It has been used. And now they don't even have the money. And the sad thing is that the money is not being used to pay for the real energy sector debt. What they are doing is that they keep borrowing the money, using it for pensions, for other non-related energy sector. And even the energy sector, what they are doing is that they are paying just some part of the interest component, some part. 
not the entire uh, component. And I recall that around September 2017, 2018, thereabout, when this government checked everything, they even came and said the whole bill was about seven billion thereabout. We said no problem. If you are getting about three, four billion, you should be able to amortize and pay. But where we are, not only do we have the old debt increasing, mm -hmm. we are getting fresh new debt compounding and piling up. And if we don't take time, by the time we assume office, we'll cross the 20 billion mark. On the subject of ESLA, did the finance minister at the time, um, Ken Oforiata, answer any questions regarding what ESLA's money uh, was being used for and why it wasn't be being applied to you know, the energy sector? By law, he's supposed to furnish parliament with the receipts and expenditure of the energy sector levies. And so by law, we get the reports. And I have the reports, annual reports. And you could see, for instance, 2019, that he used part of the money for pensions, mm. which was not supposed to be the case. And so the evidence abounds as to what he uses the money but for. But why, why, why wasn't any action taken then? Because you know, he had presented the evidence to you. This is not something that the minority is seeing on their own. Uh, the finance minister had brought it, and uh, ESLA was being used for something else. Action could it. have been taken at that, that point. We raised that on the floor of parliament. And that is what we do as lawmakers, and stated that we won't be part of that process, and cautioned. So he then decided that he would borrow $1 billion from the euro bond and use that to refinance energy sector uh, liabilities. Mm -hmm. That money was not used for that purpose. The whole $1 billion, not even $100 million was used. Not even 10%. They've squandered that whole $1 billion. And the last time we asked of it, they said during COVID, they used it for other unrelated expenditures. I see. So ESLA is not living up to the expectations. It's not it living up to expectations. For, for which it came into effect. The one billion that was borrowed in our name was not used to refinance energy sector liabilities. And so when the IMF insisted that you should capture the energy sector liabilities, then all of a sudden you saw your debt to GDP rising to 104%, which technically put Ghana in a bankrupt situation. And as we speak today, mm. We're still bankrupt because we are not servicing our debt. Okay. Away from ESLA, um, the current situation we see now, which the minority says is doomed. So, in fact, the ECG has said that they have over 600 transformer overload issues. And it's not because they do not have the power to give us. In fact, there is too much demand for power right now. No, that's hogwash. That's hogwash. It doesn't make sense. Transformers do not get overloaded overnight. Transformers get overloaded over a long period of time. It's not so possible that all of a sudden <clears throat> all ECG transformers are overloaded. What about the load shedding? 630 in the north? of them. So, what about the load shedding in the north? Are the Netco transformers also overloaded? We get a systems report every day. The day before yesterday, the deficit in terms of generation mm -hmm. was about 600 megawatts. That's a fact. And I think that this attempt to cover up based on the President's State of the Nation address, where he said there's stable power, and all of us know there's no stable power. But that even means that the ECG MD would have been fired. Because why did you sit down for 600 transformers to be overloaded? What was your maintenance schedule? What was your investment plan? What were you doing all this while? Sitting down for your transformers to get overloaded from one, two, three, up to 600, and all of a sudden the transformers get overloaded during the peak hours, when we shed load. In any case, what is Dumzo? The lights go on, they go off, they go on, they go off. That is the technical, technical definition of Dumzo. Mm -hmm. So if for three months, you keep our lights on and off consistently in the night, I leave that definition for Ghanaians because you want consistent, reliable, uninterrupted supply of power. It's not your duty to maintain transformers. Your duty is to pay your electricity bills. And you pay because you have prepaid meters. Mm. It's the duty of the ECG and the power sector players to provide that power. You're not interested in excuses. It's still the same. Whether it's fuel or overloaded transformers, your lives are going up. But I'm putting it on record. That having worked in that sector and with the knowledge I have in that sector, it is not because of overloaded transformers. It is because they don't have money to buy fuel. Mm -hmm. There's a generation deficit. And more importantly, there's a misapplication of even the little revenues they collect. Because the PRC latest report shows that for two, three months, ECG has continuously failed to pay Gridco and to pay 
VRA. And when you're unable to pay Gridco, they cannot maintain the transmission system. Mm -hmm. And so the transmission system now is weakened. We are even unable to export power. But have you tried to... Uh, we'll come back to the power exportation and why we are not able to. But have, have you been able to wrap up your mind around you know, the fact that ECG has been able to collect a lot of money over the last year, maybe even the last couple of years, but we still hear that, that it's not paying generators, it's not paying IPPs. What could be the reason? Yes, so you see, I have the cash waterfall mechanism report. You can see it here. Yes. From October 2023, all the way, I think the latest one is January. They collect on average about 800 million CDs every month. The Ministry of Finance is supposed to top up about 200 million every month. So on average, ECG collects about 1 billion. Mm -hmm. The cash water for mechanism has category A and category B. If they follow that, everybody would get something in terms of the value chain, right from generation to ECG itself. But when ECG collects the money, Ken of Oretta instructs them to use the money outside of the cash water for mechanism. And so the regulator, which is the PURC, that's the economic regulator, mm -hmm. is unable to even vouch how the money is used. And if you are unable to vouch how the money is used, it creates a major, major distortion. ECG uses the money in a haphazard manner, mm -hmm. in a manner that is determined by the Minister of Finance and not the Minister of Energy, the sector minister. They use the money outside of the cash water for mechanism, creating a huge deficit, and it's captured in the cash water for mechanism report yes, as published by the PURC. So we have a huge deficit and the debt is building up, it's getting unsustainable. Mm. And so I've briefed minority leader and we intend to meet the IMF because under the IMF agreement, we are not supposed to build all these liabilities. And if you keep building them, it means a future government will be saddled with a huge liability and this sector risk collapsing. From where we are going, I'm telling you by the end of the year, if nothing is done, mm. the entire energy sector would collapse. And that's a fact. We may be headed for a collapse. When we come back, we'll talk a bit more about ECG operations and their losses. We'll also discuss how the MD says they have been able to uh, reduce the debts they have from $1.5 to $700 million, and whether or not that is true to the best of your knowledge. You're watching Hot Issues. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest today is MP for Yape Kusogo. He's Honorable John Abdullahi Jinapo. Uh, thank you so much for your patience here on the program Hot, uh, Hot Issues. Let's talk about, uh, you know, extend our conversation on uh, the on ECG's operations and the losses. And I was saying earlier that um, this $1.5 billion that you have mentioned, which is also in the public domain, um, Dubik says, Dubik, who is the MD for um, ECG, says they have managed to bring it down to $700 million uh, after speaking and going through their books and all that. Is that something you are aware of? First of all, that's untrue. Because even the president himself <laughs> admits that the bill, the latest state of the nation address, is about $1.2 billion. So where did he get his $700 from? You recall that Dr. Baumia said the uh, debt was about $1.7 billion. Mm -hmm. At that time, we took issue. I personally led the charge on the minority side and said that's inaccurate and advised government to do a full audit. Government even came out with an Excel spreadsheet confirming that the bill was actually 1.7 billion. Lo and behold, after the audit, the bill is actually 1.2 billion. When the president himself came, the state of the nation address and admitted that the bill is not 1.7. So it's not as if somebody is done some magic. They've only eventually listened to the minority and shown that the debt is 1.2 billion and not 1.7, as Dr. Baumia sought to justify at that time. And that's mm -hmm. why we keep telling them, knowledge does not reside with only one person. And so when we advise you to listen to us and to do what is right and proper, mm -hmm. I think that sometimes you should listen. The, the concerns that uh, uh, the ECG MD has raised also about this debt is the fact that uh, it is... Also responsible for it is the take or pay agreements that uh, the previous administration uh, had signed and it's costing them a lot of money. But he just signed a take or pay agreement with AXA in September 2022. He's just signed a second take or pay agreement with AXA again. 
for 20 years. If take copy agreements were so bad, why is he signing them today? Are the percentages the same? The percentages will never be the same. Because when you go for emergency power, it's different. And the AXA plant, we've even paid for it. We signed for five years, we paid for it. And I think we shouldn't even be paying capacity charges. If you take the Tema oil, oil, uh, LNG project, they signed it. It's a take or pay agreement. Mm. No investor would come and invest and say that I'm investing, say, one billion in Ghana. And that as and when you need it, then you pay me. If you don't need it, I go and sit. There will be some element of guarantee. And I'm demonstrating to you mm. that the AXA agreement signed under this government, even Zipline, Zipline, flying of medical drones, they have put take or pay clauses there. And this was confirmed in parliament. So that is untrue. If you take the gas sector, for instance, the issue of take or pay doesn't even come in because we are consuming way and above mm. the contractual volumes with uh, our OCTP partners. So clearly, where is that take or pay? So we have always heard that we don't have a, generational, uh, a generation problem, right? And so to have more take or pays come on, was that a necessary agreement at this time? That is what they have to answer. But the truth is that nobody, no investor, you go to every bank and say, I want to come and invest in Ghana. Even with our current track record, where nobody wants to deal with us, the investor will ask, where is the guarantee? What is the assurance that you'll be able to pay? The only way you can assure the financial institutions is that you have some levels of guarantee. If you don't have it, nobody would invest in Ghana. And I've just shown that the recent ones shows that, look, without some element of guarantee, which others call capacity charges, known uh -huh. locally as take or pay, you wouldn't get that guarantee. But ECG should rather be concerned about the losses. If you have 34% losses, moving from 20% to date, if you have the level of corrupt activities, the level of opacity and duplicity mm -hmm. that characterized the PDS agreement, which led to the Americans withholding $200 million, which would have been invested in the distribution sector to ensure that you don't have this so-called overloaded or whatever uh, transformers, transformers, to ensure that the collections are efficient. That is where they ought to be looking at. Because but for the PDS scandal, the losses would have reduced to 8%. It would have brought about efficiency. But for the president unilaterally adjusting the tariffs in 2008, would have been exporting power long ago. Because President Mohammed's vision was that we should export power. That led to a project under Gridco with Ajan France Development, where we're upgrading our transmission system from 161 to 330 kVA in order to export over 200 megawatts to Burkina. Today, ECG is not burdening VRA because we export some power to Burkina. If President Mohammed had not gotten that vision to do that, he wouldn't have been exporting power to Burkina. If President Mohammed had not built a turbo mm. gas processing plant, we won't have a $300 million savings. If he had not brought in AXA, today the current ECG mm -hmm. wouldn't have had the opportunity to even sign that AXA deal and extend it from five years now to 15 years. We signed five years. They said we don't need it. We have so much capacity. Don't bring it in. Immediately the contract expired. They signed 15 years. We take or pay clauses in that agreement. I see. Now, I, I do want us to touch a bit more on the losses. Uh, uh, part of the 34% losses is also because people are um, taking advantage of the system, uh, um, you know, bypassing the, the metering system, essentially stealing power yes, from yes. the people. Right. So, um, what we know is this prepaid system was supposed to have dealt with all, all of these things. Yes. Why do you think it's not happening? Because when they came, and you see, that's why. It's not because I'm NDC or I support president. The man had a vision. President Mahama had a comprehensive, coherent, consistent way in a holistic manner to deal with the energy sector challenges. I've talked about fuel. It was dealt yeah. with. Finance, it was dealt with. Generation, it was dealt with. Distribution, PDS was supposed to deal with it. Then what you're talking about, losses. We have what you call the ATCC, Aggregate Technical Collection and Commercial Losses. Our target was to bring it to 8%. And within the industry level, that's allowable. And even the transmission, we're upgrading our system from 161 kV to 330 kVA to ensure that there's reliability, 
the system is robust, is resilient, can transmit more power and reduce the losses. So we voted about $80 million to bring in so much of what you call smart meters. Uh -huh. These meters do not require ECG officials to even come to read your meters. We're using a SCADA system, which is a system that allows you to sit from a remote area. You're able to control the whole system to know the load, to know where the power is sold, to know the collection and all that. That was a vision. They came and dealt with it in a haphazard manner. That matter is how, even... How do you mean they dealt with it in a haphazard look, they manner? they abrogated that contract in a way. The meters are still at the harbor. They refuse to clear them. The meters are gathering dust at the harbor. Since when? Since they assumed office. For almost eight years, they've simply refused to follow up with that process. I was even invited to Ioko on two occasions. They investigated and realized that there was nothing untold about it. But you see, it's state money. So at least, even if you want to prosecute us, I have no problem. But use their resources. Mm -hmm. But you decide that you won't use it. Rather, you want to procure new meters. Is, is that not considered loss to the state? That is a huge financial loss to the state. And as we prepare to come into office, those who would assume office and will be appointed by President Mahama, they have a lot of work to do in terms of holding people to account, mm -hmm. accountability, putting their feet to fire, and ensuring that they answer for their stewardship. But you see, we can't continue like that. And that's why President Mama said, on assumption of office, his main priority will be to clear the pipeline, mm -hmm. i.e. deal with pipeline projects, rather than being in a haste to come up with new contracts. And also ensure that we bring some level of sanity and some efficiency at the distribution sector. Because ECG is the key. If at the distribution level, your collections are inefficient, the losses are high, no matter what you do, it cannot transcend to the, the other the, system. I want to talk about the PURC. Um, what will be your assessment of their uh, mandate the last eight years? I think that 538, I think that's the act that establishes PURC. If we allow them and we give them the leeway, they would function effectively. And sometimes they might increase the tariffs, you will not be happy. But at least there should be some consistent, reliable power. But when there is this level of political interference, like the president tried to do by announcing tariffs himself, then you distort the whole system. When the PRC gives instructions and the ECG refuses to follow, it sets a very, very dangerous and bad precedent. When the Minister of Finance bypasses the PRC and decides that he will give ECG direct instructions and get ECG now to be procuring fuel, when that is not their core mandate, you distort the system. And those are the things that has culminated and crystallized into this current load shedding where we are shedding 600 megawatts. It's never happened. Not even under NDC in 2015 when we had power crisis with the Kosombo Dam drying up. 600 megawatts? That's a huge amount of power that's been shed. So if the PRC is given that liberty, is given that autonomy to operate, the system will be better. But what we are witnessing in this government, where the Minister of Finance, not the Minister of Energy, is micromanaging the system, giving counter instructions, sidelining the cash waterfall mechanism, sidelining PURC, mm. will continue to have the kinds of debt levels that we are witnessing. And the debt levels are threatening, they are alarming. In fact, the energy sector today is the single most mm. Challenging area, threatening area, that can collapse the economy. With, with Ken gone, do you think that things could change? Uh, you know, as far as micromanaging uh, the power sector. I concerned? hope so. It's early days yet. He's gone with his baggage and troubles, but I hope that at least this government would ensure that the right thing is done. In fact, it's not getting better because Parliament summoned all the energy sector players to appear before us. Because under oath, you cannot lie. Mm -hmm. You can tell TV3 that the transformers are loaded. Mm -hmm. But when you appear before a parliamentary select committee, just run off, they fail to appear. Just this one is that they were supposed to appear. None of them appeared. Because if they had appeared under oath, mm -hmm. they cannot lie. Because when you lie, it's perjury. They did not appear. I hope that the chairman would take that up 
because we have the powers to summon them, we've summoned them. Mm -hmm. The field, I thought about now, we should be referring them to the Attorney General. There was no, no reason. That's, that's one too many, isn't it? No, it's yeah. one too many. It's one too many. And it's because the falsehood is so much, they've peddled so much falsehood, they've gotten to a level where they simply cannot even appear before a parliamentary body. Very well. Uh, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, just uh, one more on, on the power sector, and then we'll move on to the mines. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. We are still discussing the power sector. Uh, Honorable John Abdullah Jinapo is still here with me. He's MP for Yape Kusogo. Let's talk about the availability of the fuel itself, um, chief of which is gas. How are we doing there? So, if you look at the gas, clearly our gas, and I wanted to give you the statistics, our gas production is declined. Our oil production is also declining. In fact, for four consecutive years, you are seeing oil declining. And Ken of Rata, in the 2024 budget, did indicate that crude oil production has decreased by about 10%. We handed over to this government three oil fields. Mm -hmm. They have not added even one. Eight years, not even one oil field. But do more exist? Added. We have the potential, but because of the state capture, because of the duplicity, because of the lack of transparency and the underhand dealings, AK has a problem with us. ENI has a problem with us. We are in court with ENI. ExxonMobil has exited. All the big boys are leaving this country and going to Cote d'Ivoire. Gas production has declined by about 30%. And if you do not invest, that is how the oil sector is. It will keep declining. And so even in the upstream sector, this government is leaving it in a very poor, sorrowful state. And once the gas levels are reducing, it means that you won't have enough gas to fire your thermal plants. Meanwhile, generation and demand is increasing. So we should have had a commensurate level of investment that will ensure that we get new production, mm. new fields in order to meet demand. We are not even able to plateau. It's rather declining. Mm. And so, look, this sector has been run down. Mm. It's been depleted. I've never seen or witnessed this level of incompetence. Are, are we able to pay to for, the oil for sector. I mean, to the best of your knowledge, are we able to pay for gas from the West African pipe ga gas, gas we line? We are not able to pay. Sometimes even $12 million payment is a major problem. And not just that. Mm -hmm. Upstream with the OCTP fields that the World Bank guaranteed, this government is unable to pay. So they have drawn down on the letters of credit and the payment guarantees, putting Ghana in a state of red. I see. They are not able to pay for the gas that has been consumed. Not take or pay. This gas has been consumed. It's been supplied. We've used it for power production. Mm. But they haven't been able to pay through the value chain. So the partners have had to draw down on the World Bank guarantee. And as we state, we see today, it's in red. Look, I am very worried for the future of this country. And, and let's talk about, let's talk about that future. You mentioned earlier how you had told the, uh, the, your candidate, the NDC's presidential candidate, that the energy sector is not what it used to be. What would be your advice on the three top things to be done if an NDC government comes back to office? Well, the flag bearer has constituted a team. We have the energy manifesto team, which I chair. We have a lab group, which is a technical group that's supposed to come out with real policies. Because it says that when we assume office, we hit the, round, the ground running. I chair that one as well. Mm -hmm. The first thing we are doing in the first 100 days is to reduce the losses. We are determined. We've done it before. We reduce the losses to 20% and we're down on a downward spiral mm -hmm. trend. They've come and they've just messed it up. So that is number one. We'll reduce the losses immediately. And how would you do that immediately? By putting competent people there, by being transparent, by allowing PRC to work, allowing Energy Commission to work, setting realistic, achievable targets for ECG and giving them the necessary tools through the budget system so that they can operate and allowing them and giving them the leeway to operate. Mm -hmm. Two, sending a, a confidence signal to the international community and the business community mm -hmm. in the upstream sector. And you would see that it will lead to the big boys coming back again. We've done it before. We, have, we handed over FUSO Kwame Nkrumah, FUSO Atamis, FUSO John Kufo, 
three FPSOs done by the NDC. We will do that, which will then show up revenues. Mm -hmm. It will bring about confidence, and then it will have a cascading effect and a, a true put effect. So when you deal with these two, three, we will export power. Because when we export power, we are going to get the needed foreign exchange, which will bolster the currency, which will make the economy resilient. But four and more importantly, economic management. We wouldn't have a system where we have to run down the economy and declare the economy bankrupt. It's like that the money you have given to us mm -hmm. as bonds will give you a haircut. It never happened under President Mahama. And that confidence, when we send it there, people will be willing to do business with Ghana. With the fight against Galamse, uh, we have focused a lot on illegal mining, but what we have also noticed is there are a lot of mining licenses, licenses going out in this uh, you know, administration compared to at least you know, the previous administration, which is in recent history. What can be done, really, about how the impact you know, mining is having on our environment? Because we have... Bl blatantly, it's ob obvious that we have lost the fight against uh, Galamse. So, what is the apparent solution here? Yeah, the first solution for me is that Ghana now is a frontier and expanding when it comes to mining. In fact, Ghana is number one now when it comes to the production of gold. And so we have a huge opportunity. New fields are being developed. What we are saying is that restructure the sector. Don't prevent Ghanaians from mining. Don't use the military to brutalize people. Don't engage in the corrupt activities that we are seeing by the tax force where uh, excavators are flying away and being sold, where people are in broad daylight, you can see on camera, accepting bribes. Mm -hmm. Restructure it. Give them the real licenses. Regulate them. Let them know the technology so that they can mine in a responsible manner. Now with advancement in technology, you can mine without using mercury. You can mine without polluting the environment. You can mine without polluting the waters. And so all of you who are into mining, especially the indigenous Ghanaians, His Excellency President Mahama has stated that we shall engage with you. We shall give you the necessary equipment, tools, and resources to mine. We would get more money from you, and we can reinvest in this country. It's not rocket science. At least when we were in power, we didn't see this level of pollution mm -hmm. in terms of our water bodies. This government has lost it and lost it big time. President Mahama and his administration will restructure the mining sector, make it attractive, make it responsible without compromising environmental quality. It's been done before, we can do it. Clearly we can do it. And so for me, it's as simple as that. On assumption of office, he's also, he also has a, a technical team working on mining. I'm not involved there. I mean, has, but the, they will do it. has the committee uh, in Parliament looked at some of these mining licenses that are that are being given out or have been given out the last eight years in this country? By law, you cannot even mine without parliamentary approval. By law, and so I've told all those mining companies, look, you better ensure that the government and the ministry comes to Parliament for approval. All those licenses that are going on especially those that are going on without parliamentary approval. On assumption of office, I would push, as a member of parliament, whether in government or not, that they cease operation until they get the necessary permits. It's a, it's a constitutional requirement. The constitution says that all mining leases mm -hmm. ought to be submitted to parliament for approval. Whether big or small. All leases. So if you are engaged in mining and you do not come to parliament, especially the big boys, mm -hmm. and they know themselves, and you engage in mining, you are engaging in an illegal activity. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we hold a view that Ghanaians ought to be empowered so that they can attain the commanding heights mm. of the mining sector. So, so given, not given, just given the license is not the problem. The problem is ensuring that people are doing the right things when you know, they but are given is, the license. That is why you need to come to parliament for ratification. Then we will scrutinize and ensure that all the state institutions have put in place the necessary mechanism to ensure that our environment is protected. But if you continue mining without coming to parliament, mm. first of all, that's an illegality, and it's something we ought to check. Let's talk about lithium. What's the latest on that lithium deal with uh, are the Oya mines? We have stated that the current lithium agreement in its current form mm. is a to the state. It doesn't serve the interests of the state, 
and ought to be renegotiated. The party has stated this position explicitly. And as members of parliament, we support the party's position. Mm. And we've stated that we cannot support it, it has still, It has still not reached parliament since they tested the waters with it. What do you think will be going on now? Well, maybe they want to renegotiate. Mm. Maybe they want to buy time. I see. Maybe they themselves have realized that when it comes to parliament, it will not pass. So we would encourage them to listen to what the party stated mm. and factor that into the agreement. And when it's good, when it says the interest of this country, if it's well negotiated and ensures that the local content and Ghanaian participation is enhanced, we are not obstructionists in parliament. The minority is not determined to obstruct. Mm. Our determination is to serve this country, do what is right and do what is proper. I see. What can we do to get our $12 million back as far as the Japa deal is concerned? Well, it's not just 12 million. I have the details. Oh, what is it? There's another 2 million. So we're talking of about 14 million. Not just that, I have the companies. And once again, these are companies that are related to the president's family. I they see. just shared the 12 million, like Kelly Willie, Granite, amongst cronies, mm. amongst uh, people who are connected to them. The uh, procurement processes were done in an opaque manner. No competitive process, no value for money. They just share the money. But are there any names we know, these companies that you have? Fortunately, some of the companies are law firms uh, had, uh, owned by people affiliated to the president. The insurance companies, some of them are affiliated to people in government mm. and who are connected once again, just like they did with the PDS, just like they did with the Mary. Mm. Just like almost all the scandalous deals that we have witnessed, this Japa deal is also a monumental scandal, uh, which is turning out to even mm. unveil more things. But clearly, on Thank assumption you. of office, I'm sure that the president's team Let would pursue the necessary legal action and retrieve these monies. There is very little knowledge known about uh, what that $12 million was used for. Uh, to the best of your knowledge as the minority in parliament, what do you know about this? Well, they told us that they contracted the services of some law firms, uh, insurance firms, uh, some uh, investment uh, advising firms. But the point is that we kept cautioning them that it wasn't going to be feasible. The structure was not good. You go and establish such a, a body in a safe haven where the reporting standards are not very, very good. Hmm. And uh, the level of opacity, who are the true beneficial owners, we didn't know. So clearly, it wasn't well thought out. $12 million on services alone? Uh, on all kinds of unnecessary expenditure. And, and for me, that's very, very unfortunate. And when I saw the list, I told myself, why would you do that? Is this and retrievable money? Can we get well, it back? Well, it will be very difficult. Because these are companies that did not compel you. So worst case scenario is that you might be charging a public officer for willfully causing financial loss to the states. Because the companies are independent. They did not compel you. They did not put a gun on your head. You went and asked for their services. And if you ask a lawyer to write an opinion for you, and you pay a huge amount, you cannot blame that lawyer unless you establish some level of conspiracy mm. or duplicity. And so those public officials would have to be held liable we have to ensure that they pay for their actions. And that would be or serve as a deterrent for other uh, future decisions uh, that will be taken by public officials. This week, we heard that some tax waivers were being snuck into uh, the system and the minority yes, yes, spending yes, yes. off. What are these ones about? Yeah, what we've realized is that they just go and pick some companies, bring them to parliament, give them tax waivers, and they say that's 1D1F. That's what they've been doing. All this 1D, 1F, it's not as if they are establishing factories. We ask them, how many new factories have you established? If you go to my region, Savannah region, not even one factory has been established. You go to Upper East, I'm not aware of any new factory there. So you can't take existing factories, package them, give them tax waivers in a discriminatory and haphazard manner, and then turn around and tell us, look, this is 1D, 1F. Mm, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. That's why we say we're not grand those tax waivers again. And they are huge sums of money. Millions and millions of dollars. We can't do that. 
how, how many companies are we looking at? How much would we have been losing to taxes if that had gone through? From, from uh, the back of the envelope, we are looking at about 5 billion cities. And that's a huge amount, mm -hmm. if not more. 5 billion is a huge amount. Annually? From the package they brought, where they just bring right. it and say, give them this tax uh -huh. waiver, which means they are importing certain items. They have to pay some taxes. But government say, no, I won't take the taxes. And say, what is the criteria? Why would you choose company A and leave company B? What it means is that you are disadvantaging company A. Because company A or B is paying, the other company is not paying. It's not a fair playing field. If you want a fair playing field, maybe reduce the taxes mm. and say that everybody's paying, say, 10% across board. So that within that industry, everybody's paying 10%. But to come and choose a company that you favor and to give them those kind of waivers is, 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 is woefully inadequate and unacceptable. I see. Let's stay in Parliament and talk about the impasse between uh, the Speaker and, by extension, Parliament and uh, the Presidency. For how long would, would this you know, persist as, as it is? Yeah, it only persists when the President continues to treat Parliament with that level of disrespect. I mean, the Constitution is clear how things are done, even if you won't act on it. To say that you won't accept a letter or a transmission or a memo from Parliament is very, very insulting. At least acknowledge receipt. And say that I acknowledge receipt of your letter, data, so, so, and so. But based on A, B, C, D, I'm unable to do X, Y, Z. That's decorous. That's a bit. To write and tell Parliament that we should desist mm -hmm. and cease henceforth from transmitting that letters to you. Well, let's look at him and then say, okay, also desist henceforth from sending your bills to Parliament. That will be descending. In, onto the path and, of and, 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 in, and indeed, the speaker has said that, you know, vetting of his appointees won't go on because of a, a court case. And uh, for uh, some people, including the attorney general, the speaker erred on that level. Um, I'm, very, I'm very surprised at this attorney general. When the E. Levy case was in court, he didn't know that. And he got the president to sign it. Why the double standard? Well, the argument is that Dafia Mekos, uh court uh, situation is not seeking an intervention of the Supreme Court. Um, the firm of is going to court to seek a restraining order on the speaker. Finish. If the court feels that it's not restraining this or that, or it doesn't fit here and there, the court will rule. The attorney general is not the court. He's just expressing his opinion. He's expressing his opinion to the president. The speaker is equally a lawyer. He expresses his opinion, you think that yours is superior. If you think you are superior, go to court and argue to say that based on the firm of course case, you cannot grant an injunction. But does he support the injunction on the bill? Does he support that? That the president shouldn't sign? Oh, so it does course. appear it that... It was based on his advice. Yeah, it does appear that it's a cooked thing. Let's get somebody. Let the person just go to court. And even before the person went to court, the president was talking about it. How did he know Richard Sky was going to court? He hadn't gone to court yet, though. And yet the president was telling the business and diplomatic community that there is a court case is coming that, up. Is that so? What, Check. I haven't Check. checked the date and timeline Check. on this. I see. So, so clearly, it's like, look, I won't sign it. But let me look for some innocuous, crude method to frustrate the people. MPP MPs were there. They are your party members. If you felt that you didn't want it, lobby them and let them go against it. What is the political motivation for pushing the anti-gay bill and making sure that President Akufuado signs it? Because the Attorney General says every part of that bill is politically motivated. So it's politically motivated by both MPP and NDC to make President Akufuado unpopular? Because it was unanimous. If it was a one-sided affair, then you say, oh, it's but politically motivated by the NDC to gain political advantage. So why is he saying that all the majority members in parliament, MPP members, decided that they will support MPP, NDC people so that they will lose their seats? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. Where is the sense? Where is the logic in this? He, he says it's not urgent, and he thinks that so the proponents... So tell his people in parliament. The proponents are politically motivated to It do was this. signed by both sides. The motion was moved by both sides, both MPP and NDC. I wasn't deeply involved in that, but... On the floor, 
the sponsors of the motion are not just NDC members. They are both NDC and MPP. But there is a president who says he wants to build a cathedral for God. Help us to promote proper sexual marriage in accordance with what God wants. He say no. So which is so do they support the LGBTQ movement or what? But if they don't, and they have some amendments, they could have brought it to the floor. The Attorney General had every right to come to the floor as a minister and advocate that, oh, maybe Clause 1, as Attorney General, I think that is not proper. Mm -hmm. Let's tweak it this way. So that all of us will then come up with a document. You don't sit, fold your arms, keep quiet. When it's done, then you try to punch holes in the bill. That's not what an Attorney General should do. He's a minister. He has your, audience in the chamber. Your side in Parliament is saying that, look, if this goes on, we, would, we are already looking into impeachment of the president. Uh, how are you going to That's do on that? the table. That's on the table. If both sides pass a bill and the president thinks that all the members of Parliament, 275, we are not wise enough and that we didn't do the proper thing, and he is wise, and he couldn't use whatever means to talk to his own people in the, at the consideration stage. Because this was, it was done in public. It but, wasn't shrouded but, in but secrecy. You, you must admit then he how, must have a problem. You must admit how his side is already supporting him in his letter to parliament. And so if you were to go the route of impeachment, impeachment at best you would only get the quorum to give a notice. You cannot go through with this. Let's get there. When we get, to, when we get to the bridge... We'll cross it. I think what we should do is to send a letter back to him and tell him that he should sign it. If he won't sign it, he should come back to Parliament with reasons why he doesn't want to sign it. But to say that we should desist, cease, forthwith, with sending letters to him hmm. or communications to him, that is a huge insult to Parliament. And I'm asking myself, so and at, and the, is, is that at, the, at the presidency, all the people, the, the chief of staff, his advisors, all. Is that the letter they were able to write? I mean, beyond everything, you look, let's even forget about the politics. And is that a proper letter? Is that how you communicate to parliament? That the secretary to the president writes to tell parliament that parliament should cease and desist henceforth from sending such communications to the president. Is that how they were trained? That you write to parliament with such level of disrespect? Oh. I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, look, that's not Ghana. I that's, see. that's not our standard. But, but speaking of impeachment, is the president's conduct at the moment an impeachable offense? Well, it's, it's on the table. It's on the table. But is I, it an impeachable I offense? I think that leadership will meet. Usually that's what is done. And they would communicate to the president and advise him to behave. I'm sure if he fails to do that, we would impeach him. And we would impeach him if he fails to heed our advice. I the see. impeachment is on the table. Let me assure you, it's on the table. It's one of the cards. It's not off the table. It's, we are watching that. Very well. And all options are on the table. True constitutional means the president can be impeached. And if he gets to that level, if he crosses that red line, we'll move that process. I see. So, so my guess is that, you would, that you know, if you were to impeach, you consider this uh, be behavior or conduct of the president inimical to you know, our, our constitutional democracy. An affront to the constitution, to mm -hmm. the tenets of and principles of good governance I and see. democracy. And already, we are talking to some of the majority members. And it's going well? Very, very well. Positive. And I would just wish that they would advise him mm. to sign this bill. He shouldn't delay. He should okay. sign it. If the Supreme Court is minded to strike it out, Okay. Or well, declare well, it null and void, they will do that. Indeed. While we are in Parliament, let's talk about the Minority and the Electoral Commission. Your leader came out to say that the Electoral Commission had told them that some seven BVD machines were missing, only for Electoral Commission to say no. How is that conversation going on among uh, you members on the minority side in Parliament now? First of all, I stand by the Minority Leader. I know Honorable Tiforson is a man of integrity, a man of his word. He wouldn't come out to misrepresent the minutes of whatever transpired. But the issue admits that there's some missing. So whether the mountain went to Mohammed, or Mohammed came to the mountain, or whether Jonah swallowed the wheel, or the wheel swallowed Jonah, there was some swallow or movement. They are saying that five mm -hmm. laptops were missing. 
And the EC would not just buy laptops for showcase. They would buy a laptop because they want to keep some critical information. Right. So they, no they matter say, what. They say they have no information on it. But where does this end, you know? Where is the exit for all of we this? We need an independent inquiry. We need an independent inquiry to assess all the biometric machines and their laptops and their data to ensure that the integrity of the whole electoral system is, uh, is, pre is preserved. Mm. Because in this election, the 2024 election, it's a crucial election. And Ghanaians cannot go through this excruciating, unimaginable, unparalleled, and uh, painful, terrible situation where even to put three square meals on the table is now becoming uh, a difficulty. Mm. And when they go to express their opinion and they go to vote, somebody will sit somewhere through very crooked means, uh, steal the mandate of the people. We will very not well. allow that. We must ensure that. This election is free, fair, transparent, and that President Mama is sworn in on the 7th of January. And do you get that indication right now? As yes. for the decisions being made, Ghanaians have decided that they are tired of this incompetent government. That's no, a do, fact. Do you get the indication that the EC's conduct inspires a free... No, I'm not satisfied with their conduct. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not satisfied with their conduct. I think they can do better, especially their posturing their level of engagement, I think they can do better. I see. Mm. I want to talk about the Jinapo brothers. Was it intentional to spread yourself across the three parties? No, we don't have three parties. We are two politicians. You are two politicians. Yeah. I thought the, the CPP Jinapo too was... Oh, there's no CPP. I heard that too. So there's no CPP. <laughs> so there's just the two of no, you. No, there are two. Uh, you know, I, I, I had my formal education in the North. And so I happened to associate with Haruna, John Mama, uh -huh. uh, most of the current leaders that we have. And... By association, I, I happened to join the NDC. My brother was in Ashanti region, uh -huh. and it looks like along the line at KNUST, he tend to associate with Dr. Nani and all I this. see. The thing is that we don't have a political tradition in our family. Unlike others who would get up and say, my father was a minister, mm -hmm. my, so they follow that tradition. But I think that I made the best choice. I mean, the NDC... <laughs> Better than your brother is, did. Yes, yes, yes. I'm convinced about that. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. My guest on host issues today has been uh, Yape Kosogo MP. His name is John Abdullahi Jinapo. We've had a very fantastic conversation about the power sector, the mines, and also parliament. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Hot Issues. I'm Kemeni Amano. See you again next week. Bye-bye.